All right, let's roll on to running backs. You got three guys you're a little higher on. You got Javante Williams against the Packers. You like him at 15. That's three above the experts. Aaron Jones also uh, in that same game going against Denver. Hello. Running back 10. Only one. I mean, you like him, but the experts like him just about as much. Um, And then Jeff Wilson. This is what I was looking for. At Philly, RB29, 14 spots above the experts. This is what we're paying you the big bucks for. Well, let's talk running backs. Yeah, Javante, I just thought eyeball test-wise, this is the best he's looked since returning from his injury. Green Bay is is a right bounce-back spot, as you can get fifth most rush yards on the league, fourth most schedule adjusted fantasy points, fifth most points in general to the running back position. Sure, we know it's a committee here. 35% of the snaps and just 10 touches last week. That's the floor, and it is scary. I understand that. But I think after a really solid week of tape, after showing he can make it through the game fully healthy, I think that reduced role was more injury-based than actual performance based. I bet the role continues to keep growing to running back ones this year. We've seen 14, 19, a dud with the Saints with no Alvin Kamara, but then 33 and 17 points allowed by Green Bay. I think he gets into the end zone. I think Javante gets to at least 15 points. A lot of questions coming in on him. And I like Jaleel McLaughlin too, if you're desperate, but I, I like Javante Williams. I'm ready to pass him into my lineup and, and feel good about it. Aaron Jones, though. This is more so just because I have gotten a lot of questions about him, and I don't know how. Uh, he's so explosive on a team giving up more explosive plays to running backs than any other uh, close to league history at this point. They are so, so bad against running back. 148 Jordan. yards, most in the league. Second most touchdowns, one and a half per game. Fourth most receiving yards, 53. And most receiving touchdowns surrendered to running backs so far on the year. It's as beautiful of a matchup as you can ask for. In his only other full game, Jones was the running back one in fantasy. Perfect week to just walk in, two weeks of rest. I imagine he'll be as close to full health as we'll see all year. And I think he's going to – this is just a classic Aaron Jones, like 30-point blow up. You could not have him on your bench in a spot like this. And then Jeff Wilson, as you said, the biggest discrepancy of the list, 14 spots. It's more so a bet on the fact that I, I do believe in Mostert. I'm not worried about his role. This is not an indictment on him. Still a top 10, I think top six running back for me this week if I double-check my rankings. But I think Wilson could end up inheriting the goal line work, which we've seen this team lead the NFL in rushing touchdowns all year. Jeff Wilson was the hammer for him last year. His first couple games of the team, 16, then 20, 12 points in the first half. Wilson was a perfect fit on a less explosive run game last year. I think this is the perfect spot for them to try to hammer this defense. And I know it's one of the best D lines in the league. It's a scary thing to plug Jeff Wilson here, but this is my bet. Similar to Sullivan Ahmed last week. I I think he takes over the clear number two role, and that's been a very valuable spot for running backs all year. So Jeff Wilson, if you're desperate, you picked him up and you have to decide between him or, or picking up like Zach Evans on the waiver wire. I'd rather just roll with Jeff Wilson and not burn that roster spot on Evans. I got, I got the worst. I've been doing fantasy for probably 30 years. I got probably the worst trade offer I've ever gotten in my life. Uh, oh, a couple of days so ago from, from a friend of mine, um, son who's in high school. So it, it wasn't like a troll offer. He wasn't trolling me. It's like, he actually was like, Hey, what do you think of this? And he offered me AJ Dillon and Dalvin cook for Raheem Mostert. Oh, come on. Who would ever accept that? (laughs) I I just, I was like, so you would offer me the RB45 and the RB61 for the RB2. (laughs) And you're, you're sending me this with a straight face. And and he he was like, you got a lot to learn, boy. (laughs) Like, son, like, don't call me again unless you're serious. I I was, I was appalled. I was just appalled. It's time to grow up, son. (laughs) <laughs> lower i know seriously lower jonathan taylor against cleveland you like him at 19 four below the experts i mean if you ask me he has not looked too great i know he's still supposed to be rounding into form but i have not been that impressed um especially my, my buddies that have been sitting on him all year waiting and then sprung him out and they're like this is going to turn my team around hasn't exactly turned their teams around yet <laughs> um i still think we could get something out of him though zach evans against pittsburgh you talked about your thoughts on him earlier, but elaborate a little bit. You like him at 32. The experts like him at 27. And then Najee Harris at the Rams. You like him at 34. The experts, for some reason, like him all the way up at 21. Um, go on. Talk about those guys. <laughs> yeah, let's dive in. Uh, of course, Taylor, you know, the highest of these running backs, the least worried of them I am. But a lot of questions come in. Can you trust J- Jonathan Taylor yet? And if I don't have to, I really don't want to this week. It's a bottom five matchup. Cleveland's defense and front seven have been 
monstrous. The season high in terms of half PPR points they've allowed this year was 12.7 last week, and that was to Christian McCaffrey. You hold Christian McCaffrey to 12.7, and that's the goal you've given up? That's pretty scary. For comparison's sake, Derrick Henry against this defense, 11 carries, 20 yards, similar kind of role to what Jonathan Taylor is, is more of a, a kind of up-the-gut, bruising type of running back. Zach Moss has continued to out-snap and really outplay Jonathan Taylor since he returned. 80% of the snaps in Week 5, 49% of the snaps, so it became a much clearer split for Zach Moss and Taylor. But ultimately, Zach Moss has been the running back two and running back eight since Taylor returned. Taylor himself, running back 35 and running back 20. And last week in that running back 20 finish, that was a great matchup for him. And he still didn't really light the world on fire, kind of dependent on receiving volume there. So I still think he's kind of rounding himself into form. Zach Moss is still remaining here and relevant. And this is not the game. If, if you don't have to risk it against Cleveland, that's not where you want to put your eggs into this basket right now. I know most of you, will, if you're starting Taylor, it's probably out of necessity on a week like this. I have a lineup where I'm playing freaking Keontae Ingram. So I get it. Like, I'd rather have Jonathan Taylor than that. But in a league where you could decide between him and someone like Jerome Ford on the other side of the rock, I'd probably rather go with a Cleveland running back right now. I'm worried about Taylor, at least for this week. Zach Evans on the other one. Uh, a lot of people, this is going to be one of the biggest questions of the week. Can I trust? Can I start Zach Evans? Yep. Uh, and it's not a bad matchup, Pittsburgh, but I do not trust Evans at all. You know, McVay asked, can we expect Zach Evans to start since he was the next man up after Kyron went out last week? His first comment, I wouldn't say that. Hey, we've got a lot of week to evaluate this. You know, you'd love to see a ring endorsement. Yeah, Evans earned it. He's been great in practice. We love him. He said really not anything positive. He did mention that, yeah, we, we like how Evans has looked in practice, but the, the beat writers wisely pointing out, Evans has been the scout team running back all year. He has not once been running the actual Rams offensive scheme. So he's on pretty much equal footing to all these new guys they brought in. Daryl Henderson, who after McVay said, no, I don't expect uh, Evans to 100% be the starter, then went on to praise Henderson, how great it is to have this guy back, how familiar with the scheme he is, how reliable he is in pass protection. And that's kind of my biggest rub with Evans is he could never in college ever, despite being this five-star high school recruit and this one of the best players in the nation, he never once defined himself as a college running back, could never seize a lead running back role at TCU, right. at Old Miss even, was outplayed by a freshman when he was there. He's just never been a lead back, and I don't expect that to change now at the professional level, even though he's competing with Jags and Royce Freeman, Henderson, Gaskin. I think he's just a Jag himself, and I don't think he's going to be trusted with Matthew Stafford, keeping him upright, keeping him pass protected. I imagine those snaps are going to go to a veteran who's done it before, uh, and that's more valuable to this team right now than trying to establish a rookie running back who's just not that good in general. So if you're betting on Evans, it's a pure opportunity bet. And is there a chance he just takes the Kyron Williams role, gets 18 t touches, gets the goal line work? Sure, that's all very possible. But to me, yeah, Royce Freeman's a bigger back. Daryl Henderson's more trusted in pass protection. Gaskin, who they brought in, I've always been a Miles Gaskin fan. I think he's just a better outright runner right now than any of the guys they have here. So to me, it's a, it's a four-headed. We'll see who's actually activated. We'll see if there's any other tea leaves heading into Sunday. But as of today, we're recording on Thursday. I have no interest in putting Evans in my lineup. I called him fool's gold on our waiver wire show. I think he's fool's gold if you put him in your lineup this week. I do not trust him. But let us know if you have Evans' questions. There's a good chance I'm not going to go with him. And then as mentioned, Najee Harris, a whopping 13 spots below ECR. I just don't get how he's the running back 21. He's had only one game above the running back 31 on the season. He's been outside your top 40 running backs in three of his starts so far this year. In every single it week. It's weird. It's, it's weird. weird. Jalen Warren has outscored him legitimately every single week of the year on you know less than half the work. We started to see the, the backfield turnover, you know, 49%, a career high for Jalen Warren last week. I wouldn't be shocked at all. We see teams make big switches after the bye weeks. Wouldn't be stunned at all if all the, the entire backfield gets turned over to Jalen Warren this week and Najee is the second fiddle. They do have all the draft capital invested, and uh, there's a sunk cost fallacy related to that. So I get it, and I do expect him to continue to be involved. But against a, a tough Rams defense, 25th in points allowed to the backs position, in a situation where he hasn't been good all year anyways, why is he a locked-in regular, like a high-end running back too in the expert rankings. That is the one that makes zero sense to me. Uh, I want nothing to do with Najee Harris. I, who's ranking him this high? It, it makes no sense to me. I, I, I guess a bunch of people. I don't know. It, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me either. You know, I've been out on this guy for like, you know, a year and a half at least. But 
you would think that as more and more data rolls in and you can actually see, okay, this is game upon game upon game when he's been like outside the top 30 as far as RBs when there's like 32 teams in the NFL. You would think that that would count for something. I, it kind of, not to bring him up, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of Kyle Pitts. But just like we, we see again and again and again and again him like not do anything. And for some reason, he still lingers around like tight end six or something. I don't get it. Hey, don't anyway. hate on the man that was a, a top three tight end a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Trust me, you know I'm a Kyle. It doesn't Pitts. take much to be a tight end. I mean, you know, 40 yards and a touchdown, that'll put yeah, you top Well, that's what he did pretty much, exactly. That's exactly what he on did. On American yeah. soil, I think it's his first touchdown ever scored on American soil. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> that is so funny. Anyway, um, let's talk Hail Marys. We got Craig Reynolds going at the Ravens, 18% owned. I completely agree with what you said before about the Ravens, where they have not really gone against anybody yet this year um, and really kind of earned their chops. Keontae Ingram also 22% against Seattle. Reynolds, obvious, with Montgomery out. There's obviously going to be a, a value hole there. But uh, anything else to say about him? Yeah, it's just tricky. It's an ugly week, as we've said so many times. Reynolds, to me, would be the first one I'd look to. Dan Campbell absolutely loves this guy. And you saw why. He does those little things. He threw a huge block on Amon Ross St. Brown's touchdown where he just pancaked the guy. And, and I love those things. And certainly Dan Campbell, the former player, he loves that stuff. And after the game, he couldn't stop raving about it. He played, said Craig Reynolds plays for the guys around him. He does everything right, all the little things. He shows up in critical times. Couldn't praise him more for all those things. And, and remember last year in Hard Knocks, I remember him saying, We'd be sick if we ever lost Craig Reynolds. We cannot cut this guy. So we know Dan Campbell's a huge believer in him. And honestly, I like the guy too. Every time he plays, he seems to be churning out positive yards, making his impact felt. Last time Monty Montgomery was out, he only saw about 30% of the snaps, but he was ultimately splitting time with Zonovan Knight in the backup role. And that was with yeah. a fully healthy Jameer Gibbs, who did see 17 carries, saw 60% of the snaps. I don't think Gibbs coming off a hamstring injury is going to see that big of a workload. I think this will be much closer to a 40-60 split. Yeah, maybe favoring Gibbs. But I think Reynolds will absolutely get his work, and he'll be the first guy up when they get into the red zone. So if you're desperate for a back, I, I know the Ravens not the best of matchups, but I do think Reynolds would be the first one I look at because I just believe in the offense and believe in his touchdown upside there. Keontae Ingram's a much less – it's a much flimsier play here. But he did ultimately dominate the carry share and dominate loosely. You know, 37% of the rush attempts compared to 30% for Damian Williams. But the big thing was Amari DiMarcato, who a lot of people were all in on. He ultimately only played 7% of the rush attempts. Played more of the snaps, saw a bunch of the routes. It's an ugly situation, but the, the Seahawks have been a middle-of-the-pack matchup. We're looking for volume at this point. He put up seven points last week. He was a top 30 running back on that. Seems like he'd be the, the favorite for goal line work. It, again, when you're getting this muddy, this ugly, you're just looking for some volume and a shot at a touchdown. And I think Keontae Ingram has that, even if it's it's pretty hideous. It's a, it's a very flimsy play. But again, we're, we're dealing with six teams on buys and a ton of injuries. Uh, the other guys, of course, maybe the Bears, You know, if, if Dr. Foreman got cut. But yeah, those are the, the two guys I would look to at for now. What is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments. Check out some more videos. And join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below. Ooh.